From a country based on agriculture to one driven by high tech, Ireland is one of Europe's economic success stories, ranking among the wealthiest countries in the world. In 1921, the British government split the continent's third largest island into the mainly Protestant North and the mainly Catholic South. The southern region became a free state in 1922, and 15 years later, a new constitution was adopted. Ireland effectively became a republic, then one of Europe's poorest nations. By the 1950s, the Irish people had started to turn things around, and in the 1990s, Ireland became known as the Celtic Tiger. And now the Irish government is looking to play a more prominent diplomatic role in the world. A member of the European Union, Ireland secured the 128 votes required in the UN General Assembly to win a two-year non-permanent seat in the Security Council. The country's top diplomat, Foreign Minister Simon Coveney, is determined to promote what he calls Irish values on the world stage. Coveney even travelled to Tehran recently to meet with Iranian President Hassan Rouhani, aiming to make Ireland a mediator between the parties involved in the disputed nuclear deal. Will he succeed at what seems to be one of the world's most pressing diplomatic challenges and what's the Irish perspective on other international affairs, from Brexit to the COVID-19 pandemic? Ireland's Foreign Affairs and Defence Minister, Simon Coveney, talks to Al Jazeera. Simon Coveney, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defence of the Republic of Ireland, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Currently, your country serves as one of the 15 members of the UN Security Council, the fourth time you've had that role since Ireland joined the UN in 1955. What do you see as the obligations and the current challenges for you in this role? Well, I mean, we've been incredibly fortunate as a country to be voted on to the UN Security Council for a fourth time. So we've, we've essentially been on the Security Council every 20 years uh, since we joined the UN. And, um, we see it as a really important part of Irish foreign policy. Uh, it's an opportunity for Ireland to be a global voice for the things that we're passionate about. Uh, international law, multilateralism, human rights, uh, the link between development and conflict, peacekeeping. So there are many areas where um, uh, Irish values and an Irish perspective of the world, uh, I hope, can contribute positively to the often very partisan and difficult debates that we get on the Security Council uh, in terms of the 30 or so files that the Security Council is dealing with. Uh, and I hope that Ireland as a, as a non-threatening, relatively small country, but a country that has big opinions, uh, will, able to, will be able to, uh, to facilitate and to support more consensus building within a Security Council that, particularly in the last number of years, has been terribly divided and at times very ineffective uh, in terms of preventing conflict. One of the most pressing issues right now in international diplomacy is Iran's nuclear program. You have recently visited Tehran. You met various Iranian officials, including President Rouhani. What was the purpose of that visit? Were you going as a mediator? Well, I mean, you know, Ireland has a role on the Security Council, a formal role of facilitator for what's called Resolution 2231, which is essentially the basis for the Iranian nuclear deal or the JCPOA, as it's called, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Unfortunately, in 2018, uh, the previous US administration uh, decided that the JCPOA was, was something that they could no longer support. Uh, and that was replaced, in Washington at least, uh, by a maximum pressure uh, policy, which, which essentially replaced uh, trying to ensure that the JCPOA was working uh, with uh, really tough sanctions uh, to put Iran under pressure uh, for a whole series of reasons. Um, so Ireland has put its hand up to say that we would play a facilitator role on the Security Council on this issue to help bridge the gaps that remain to ensure that we can get people talking uh, and we can find a way forward uh, and a political sequencing, which I think is what's necessary 
uh, to see Iran return to full compliance and the US uh, take a position uh, that removes the sanctions that are linked to the JCPOA issues uh, from Iran. And so anybody who assumes uh, that it's an easy process to bring Iran back into full compliance with uh, the conditions of the JCPOA, uh, I think doesn't understand the complexity of politics in Iran, which is complex um, and moderates uh, in the Iranian government, uh, I do think would like to see a full return to compliance with the JCPOA in return for the full removal of the sanctions uh, that are linked to that agreement. Um, uh, but there is also uh, hardline opinion uh, and a lot of pressure in the Iranian political system, uh, particularly in the build up to elections in June, uh, which I think makes a return to compliance with the JCPOA very difficult. And in fact, what we're seeing now is the opposite. We're seeing Iran moving further and further and further away from compliance with the conditions uh, of the agreement which of course is very worrying uh, for, for anybody who is watching. And don't the Iranians, Minister, don't the Iranians have a point here? It was the Trump administration that pulled out of the deal. Uh, and now we have a situation where neither side, the US or Iran, wants to move first. But shouldn't it be the US that eases some sanctions? Because the time for diplomacy with those elections you mentioned is running out. Yeah, well, it is true to say that the window is very tight, you know, because uh, electioneering will certainly be very much underway in May. So we really have a month or five weeks or so to try to make progress on this issue. I think to be fair to the new US administration, they have given very strong and positive signals in terms of the direction that they want to take uh, and the willingness to talk, uh, to work out what needs to be done uh, to, to support the JCPOA, because don't forget, so much has changed since 2015, some of it irreversible, uh, and it's important that none of us are naive in relation to that. Um, but yes, the, the point that, the, uh, that Iran would make is that they were committed to the JCPOA, uh, they were not the ones that broke the deal, uh, and so they are essentially looking for the US to be the first mover, if you like. But I think they also need to understand the complexity of the politics of this for a US administration. Um, and that is a, a significant challenge. Uh, and I think that both sides have to understand the political challenges of getting this done for each other. Uh, and that's why it's important that, that there are countries that want to act as facilitators uh, and that the others that are involved in the JCPOA, particularly the E3 countries, Germany, France, uh, and the UK are as proactive as they can be in terms of trying to get a dialogue in place again that can allow us to take the steps necessary and create some positive momentum because the world needs a big good news story right now. Uh, we are all tired and exhausted on the back of the impact of COVID-19. Uh, there has been so much conflict in recent years uh, that if we could generate a positive narrative around a return to the JCPOA, a, uh, a move away from the risk of Iran becoming a nuclear power, which for many uh, is hugely problematic uh, in terms of uh, regional instability, uh, then I think that would be uh, a very strong good news story worth fighting for. You talk about a world of conflict and many of the files you're confronted with on the Security Council have been there for years, some for decades, but there are new ones too. And let me mention two, which are very different and on different continents, but in terms of the international response, they seem to be pretty similar. And that's the current situation in Tigray province, in Ethiopia, yeah. and the situation in Myanmar. First Myanmar, coup on the 1st of February. The Security Council has come up with two statements denouncing it, and yet the violence is only getting worse what do you do now and isn't there a risk to the credibility of the Security Council if you don't take further action? Yes, is the straight answer to the last question. Um, you know, this is a military coup uh, that is now effectively uh, trying to stamp out uh, resistance uh, and opposition to that coup. Um, it's anti-democratic. Um, uh, we know uh, from a general election uh, at the end of last year 
uh, what the people want in Myanmar, and it is not a country run by a military junta. Um, and so uh, the Security Council, to be fair, has taken a united approach so far in terms of making an initial statement. Uh, the US has also taken a strong measures in terms of sanctions. The EU has followed. Um, uh, and so the more uh, unity we can create around the need for change, uh, a release of political prisoners, an uh, end to uh, to uh, a state-sponsored violent and aggressive response to legitimate protest, uh, the better. But I think, you know, you do have to understand the politics of the Security Council to understand why this is very difficult to get done. For the Security Council to take a much tougher line and to stay united is very difficult uh, because of the regional relationships uh, linked to Myanmar. Uh, and so I think the challenge for countries like Ireland and others is to try to bring the Security Council or encourage the Security Council on a path that keeps it together, but at the same time takes a stronger position uh, to encourage the military leadership in, uh, in Myanmar to change tack. And then you move to Ethiopia, to Tigray province, yeah. where there's been a military operation going on in, in, since November. It's turned into a humanitarian human rights uh, catastrophe, I think it's fair to say. Your ambassador at the UN tried to get a statement on the situation there, and th on this case, it's even worse than Myanmar. The, the Security Council couldn't agree action. It couldn't agree words either. Well, the the UN has agreed uh, words here. Uh, the uh, uh, the the General Secretary Antonio Guterres has, I think, been very clear in relation to his concern here. Uh, UN organisations have also, in terms of the need for humanitarian access, uh, Ireland has been very proactive on this issue. Uh, we have a very strong relationship with Ethiopia. We have had for many, many years. It, it is our largest development programme with any other country in the world uh, and has been uh, for quite some time. We have staff in Tigray as part of that um, development work uh, in terms of a big agricultural project there. So, you know, we, Ireland has people on the ground who've been reporting back. What, what has happened in Tigray is very worrying. Um, uh, in my view, a number of things need to happen now. First of all, we have to have full humanitarian access uh, into that region. Uh, not only regions that are, not only parts of the Tigray region that are controlled by the Ethiopian military, but also other parts of the Tigray region, uh, some areas that are controlled by Eritrean, uh, troops uh, who should not be there, uh, others that are controlled by the opposition and others that are controlled effectively by paramilitary uh, groups. Um, and this is a challenge. Now, I think we are making some progress uh, with the Ethiopian government and I think it's important to recognise that. Uh, in recent days there, there has been progress in relation to humanitarian access, uh, uh, but it's still not where it needs to be. Um, secondly, we've got to have a, a genuinely independent assessment of what has happened here in terms of whether or not atrocities have, uh, ha have happened and uh, people need to be held to account for that. And I think the international community is watching closely, as is the UN Security Council, uh, insisting on that progress uh, accelerating now. Doesn't this all highlight a wider problem. Don't the generals in Myanmar and the Prime Minister in Ethiopia both know something, which is currently, with the current dynamics of the Security Council, China and Russia are not going to authorise sanctions. They are two countries that don't like sanctions. They're two countries that are currently being sanctioned both by the US and the EU. And as, as a result of that, has the Security Council not lost its teeth? Well, I mean, I think there are many examples of the Security Council not having the teeth that it should have. I think that's true. And, um, you know, we've seen uh, irresponsible use of the veto, um, uh, P5 members, and there's no one country to blame there. There are a number of countries that have used their veto irresponsibly, in my view, at different times. Um, having said that, I, I'm not sure I would draw too many, too many parallels between Ethiopia and Myanmar. They're very different um, circumstances that need a Security Council response. I would say that, the, that we are making some progress and pressure is working, uh, although not as fast as we would like uh, in the context of Ethiopia. That pressure has not worked at all in relation to Myanmar as of yet anyway. 
Um, but look, you know, this is, this is the challenge now for the Security Council. Um, when Ireland was last on the Security Council 20 years ago, there were 13 files that the Security Council was dealing with. Today, it's over 30 files. So it's almost trebled uh, in terms of the number of conflicts uh, and uh, difficult conflict-related and security-related situations that the Security Council is now focused on. And I think that is a lesson, if ever there was one, uh, of the growing number of conflicts, the increased pressure in different parts of the world, leading to, to tension, instability and conflict, uh, often regional, uh, rather than involving simply two countries uh, in, in a conventional um, um, a military uh, clash. Uh, and so the Security Council has got to become more sophisticated with those changes, and it hasn't managed to make that journey. Uh, and instead, it's still a very rigid process. It's still a very divided Security Council on certain debates. In your time as Foreign Minister, you deal with countries all over the world, but I'm betting that you've spent a, a far large amount of your time, or, or a pretty large amount of your time, on one issue, and that concerns your uh, big neighbour, the UK, yeah. and Brexit. Now, we've spent so much air time talking about Brexit, I don't want to go very much into detail on all the issues here, but the big picture with regard to it, the Good Friday Agreement was 23 years ago. Given all the current tensions, do you believe that peace deal is resilient or are you worried? Well, we know that the peace deal is very resilient. I mean, it's, it's survived more than two decades now. Uh, many people thought it wouldn't. Um, uh, it has guaranteed at least a, a basic standard of, uh, uh, of political interaction. Um, uh, it's, it's provided political structure in Northern Ireland. Uh, people are working now in the same room that uh, it, before that peace agreement would hardly talk to each other. Um, so what we have on the island of Ireland in the context of a peace process is precious, needs to be protected. That Good Friday Agreement was the work of genius in my view, uh, allowing uh, unionism and loyalism and uh, nationalism and republicanism uh, uh, and, and others as well in Northern Ireland who don't identify with any of those labels uh, to work together. Uh, it's provided a platform for north-south cooperation on the island of Ireland and indeed east-west cooperation between the British and Irish governments. So uh, the Good Friday Agreement is resilient. It's certainly been tested uh, and it's been tested at the moment. Um, Brexit is an enormous disruptor uh, on many levels. Uh, I mean that is uh, there's no other way to put it. You know, Brexit is about creating separation, difference, differentiation between the UK and the EU. Um, and so to manage a peace process, which is about bringing people together rather than focusing on difference, uh, is, is of course challenging politically. And I've spent uh, an enormous amount of my working life over the last three or four years focused on trying to find solutions that could manage the disruption of Brexit to the greatest extent possible uh, and uh, in particular in the context of protecting a peace process uh, and the stability of relationships on the island of Ireland. Do I believe that we can manage this? Yes I do. Do I believe that the Good Friday Agreement can survive uh, Brexit and the protocol? Yes I do. But I think many of us will need to work very hard uh, to make sure that that's the case. On top of this Minister there has been another dispute with the UK, and that's about COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, lots of angry words. And recently, the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, had to apologise after telling his MPs in a private meeting, and I quote, the reason we have vaccine success is because of capitalism, because of greed, my friends. What do you make of comments like that? Well, look, I'm not going to comment on, uh, on, on what the British Prime Minister said to a, to a private party meeting, um, but look, they, there is tension over vaccines. Uh, there's no question about that. I mean, the EU has exported over 40 million doses of vaccine out of the EU to date. Uh, some of the countries that are criticizing the EU's rollout of vaccine haven't exported any vaccine uh, into the EU, uh, even though there's a demand for it. Um, some of the companies that the EU has approved in terms of vaccine rollout have not followed through on their commitments to the EU. So the way in which the EU is managing vaccine rollout is we have pre-purchase orders, if you like, 
uh, with four companies at the moment that have been approved, Pfizer, uh, AstraZeneca, uh, Janssen and Moderna. Uh, and, uh, and AstraZeneca in particular have been a problem because they promised a lot in terms of delivery and haven't managed to follow through on that at all. And so uh, what the EU wants to understand is whether AstraZeneca are following through on their commitments to other countries, uh, the UK being an example. Uh, and there is a lot to suggest that AstraZeneca are fulfilling their commitments to other countries, but not to the EU. And so that's caused a lot of strain within the European Union, particularly given the fact that we're exporting so many vaccines, um, not just to the UK, but to other parts of the world as well. So, Minister, Minister, hasn't this been a total failure by the European Union? And shouldn't there be some accountability? Shouldn't the buck stop somewhere? Should perhaps a commissioner resign? Should perhaps, I remember 1999, I was in Brussels at the time, the whole commission resigned. This is an issue that affects every citizen of the EU. It's an issue that affects lives. Lives are going to be lost because of the poor uh, rollout. And it's going to affect your economic recovery. It's very serious. Well, first of all, I don't think we can, we can judge the, uh, the vaccine rollout um, in terms of whether it's been a success or not just yet. Uh, certainly, it's been a poor start uh, in terms of the relationship with AstraZeneca in particular. Um, but I still think that by the end of July, you will see certainly close to 70% of Europe's population or the EU's population vaccinated. Um, so, you know, um, let's, let's wait and see how this rolls out. I think the alternative was uh, that if the European Commission didn't manage centrally the rollout of vaccine for the member states of the European Union, that, that we would have had 28 member states all competing with each other for scarce vaccines. And I think that would have been chaotic and it would have been detrimental to relationships across the European Union. We're really only going to be able to judge the success of vaccine rollout in the uh, across the EU uh, in midsummer. And b by the way, I don't think that is the extent of the challenge that the EU faces, and indeed other parts of the world too, because the focus should not only be on getting Europeans vaccinated. Uh, the European Union and the US and others uh, have also got to focus on making sure that the rest of the world gets access to vaccines too, uh, in terms of manufacturing facilities, uh, so that we can deliver the kind of volumes that a global population needs. Minister, there'll be viewers watching our interview all over the world. And there, as you know, there are countries where there are very few people vaccinated and some countries where there are no people vaccinated. Correct. The UN Secretary General said vaccine equity is the biggest moral test before the global community. And he's right. Is it a test that uh, the UN has failed? The UN and the international community has failed? No, I think, it's, I think it's too early to make that judgment. But certainly, I am very conscious of the fact that there are still... Uh, over a hundred countries in the world that have no access to, access to vaccine at all. Um, and also in many of those countries have much weaker health systems than, than the country that I'm privileged to live in has and many other countries uh, across the EU and North America as well. So, you know, the, the irony and in some ways the injustice of this is that the countries that have the strongest healthcare systems um, and also probably the deepest understanding of this virus in terms of how it behaves are also the countries that have the first uh, access to, uh, to vaccines. And many from other parts of the world may see the part of the world that I come from squabbling politically over, uh, over the pace of vaccine rollout while they can't get access to any vaccines at all. Um, so I'm very conscious of that. And, you know, the UN needs to continue to keep this issue on the agenda. Uh, because in my view, as we move through the summer, uh, we will start to see significant excess availability of vaccine in some parts of the world. And we have to make sure um, that, that those vaccines are shared. Uh, and indeed, uh, we need to ensure that we work with uh, pharmaceutical companies to ensure that the IP in relation to the vaccines that are available and trusted can be shared in a way that allows manufacturing to significantly increase. Minister, my final question, and it's about you. You are one of the top politicians in Ireland. You're still relatively young. Are you hungry one day to lead your country? Do you want to be the Taoiseach, I Ireland's Prime Minister? My focus really now, particularly while on the Security Council, 
is, try, is to try to ensure that the experience that I have and the motivation that I still have in politics is used to good effect, to try to ensure that Irish thinking uh, is as impactful as it possibly can be on an international stage uh, through the Security Council in particular, but also uh, within the EU and within the UN uh, and other, other multilateral uh, institutions. So, you know, I'm not thinking beyond that at the moment. Uh, I've got more than enough to do to keep me busy, I can assure you. And some of the issues that we're speaking about today uh, are, uh, are challenging enough, I think, to keep most people awake at night. So thanks very much, but I, I'm not giving you a, a yes or no answer to that question. I've got enough on my plate for now. Simon Coveney, the Foreign and Defence Minister of Ireland, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you, anytime.